A blind man walks into a bar in Texas. He sits on the stool. He says, wow, this bar stool is really, really big. And the bartender says, well, of course it's big. It's Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. Blind man says, all right, orders a drink. Gets a drink. It's this great big two-hander. Oh, man, that's tragic. It's a great big two-hander of a thing. Uh, and he says, wow, that's a huge drink. So, of course, it's a big drink. This is Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. So the blind man, uh, he says, listen, i got to go to the bathroom. Uh, where is the second door on the left? So the blind man, he walks out. He's feeling his way down. He, he accidentally goes in the first door on the left, which is the pool. He falls into the pool, and he starts screaming, don't flush! Don't flush! There you go. Jokes. Everybody likes that. Let's spin the wheel. So that's how that works. See? So if you have anything you think about, anything you want to talk about, anything on your mind, try to keep it light because it's a happy place. All right. Ooh, a short story. Cool. Let's do the short story. Down. Let's do it in the theater. I would like to perform Mr. Black. This is uh, by one of my favorite writers. Uh, he's a feature writer from CBS News for many, many years before I was born. His name is Charles Kuralt, and uh, he has an important place in my heart. When I first started doing stand-up comedy, I had cassette tapes of his books on tape where he talks about all of his travels, and he was kind of an inspiration to me uh, to make the most out of my trips when I, when I would go. So this is, let's find it. I want to read you Mr. Black. This is a good one. Let's see. We got some monologues, short stories. There we go. Mr. Black. <clears throat> this is Mr. Black by Charles Kuralt. George Black was a brickmaker. He turned out to be a pretty good diplomat for the State Department, too, but that part of the story comes much later. George Black was a brickmaker, and the fact, the craft, and he and his brothers chose when their father died in 1889. We aren't going to get to go to school, his brother, 14, said to George, 11. We're going to have to work for a living. If we haul ourselves up and make men out of ourselves, someday, even if we don't know A from B, we'll make somebody call us Mr. Black. Someday. Mr. Black quoted his brother with pride more than 80 years later. He was a tall, dignified old man. Everybody called him Mr. Black. The little boys, George and his brother, setting out on their own in 1889, walked 40 miles from Randleman, North Carolina, to Winston-Salem. They apprenticed themselves to a brickmaker for a while, and after they learned the trade, they started their own business while they were still in their teens. Since well before the turn of the century, George Black had been making bricks the way I watched him do it one afternoon in his backyard. He had a mule hitched to what he called a mud mill. With his glant, practiced hands, Mr. Black scooped up the mud mixed by the paddles of the mill as the mule plodded in a circle and packed the mud expertly into six brick forms ready for the kiln. How many bricks do you figure you've made in your life? I asked him. Oh, Lord, he said, I don't know. I'd be most afraid to know. He handed a finished form to one of the neighborhood youngsters who were serving as stackers that day and impatiently awaited another stack of empties. I made a million bricks in one year, he said. Mr. R.J. Reynolds rode out here on a white horse. He always rode a white horse, you know. He asked me if I thought I could make a thousand, thousand bricks. He said he had in mind to build a tobacco factory. I studied and said yes, I could. I did, too. And you can go downtown and see them if you want to. That building's still there. They're all my bricks. Yes, sir. I found myself filled with admiration for this man standing in a pit before me in mud up to his elbows. He had made a life of the basic elements, water and earth and fire, and he had made the building blocks of a city. Mr. Black dressed up his Sunday suit the next day and took me on a stroll about Winston-Salem. These bricks we're walking on, he said as we passed through the restored village of Old Salem. I made those about 40 years ago. They're holding up nice. Yeah. He pointed with his cane. I made the bricks for that building over there. There was a schoolhouse. I made the bricks for the old home church over there, he said. I made the bricks for that brick wall yonder. Wherever we walked, he pointed out the work of his own hands. When we reached the block-long R.J. Reynolds factory, he said, I believe I told you wrong about this job. It wasn't a million bricks. It ended up being a million and a half. He leaned on his walking stick and looked up at the massive structure. Made these bricks six at a time. Put them out on the board and put them in a kiln and burned them for a dollar and a half a day. You don't know it, but that was good pay in those days. Yes, sir. We walked on, made all these bricks six at a time, Mr. Black said, and I'm going to make me some more yet. 
The morning after our story about Mr. Black went on the air, I was sitting on the edge of my bed in the motel room, rubbing my eyes and trying to figure out where to go next when the phone rang. It was the CBS News State Department correspondent, Marvin Kalb. Of course, that made it a red-letter day for me right there. I wasn't used to getting phone calls from Marvin Kalb. He said, there's a guy at the Agency for International Development who wants to talk to you. His name is Harvey J. Witherell. He's on the Guyana desk over there. You know, I think he probably is the Guyana desk. I don't know what he wants with you, but he's been calling me all morning. I wish you'd give him a ring and get him off my neck. Sure, Marvin, I said. If it turns out to be anything I can help you with, let me know. Marvin said generously and a little wearily. The life of a State Department correspondent must be hard. He has the whole world to worry about all the time. When I reached Harvey J. Witherell, his voice was trembling with excitement. Here, her, here, <clears throat> I heard you had a story about a brickmaker on television last night, he said. Yep, I said. Oh, gosh, I've been looking all over this country for a brickmaker who still does the job by hand, Harvey J. Witherell said. I didn't think there were any left. What's he like? He's a nice man, I said. You see, Harvey J. Witherell said, the government of Guyana wants us to send a brickmaker down there. They have a five-year plan or something like that to rebuild the whole country in brick. They have no shortage of raw materials. I mean, there's plenty of mud in Guyana, but hey, they don't want to build a big brick factory. They want somebody to go teach them how to make bricks for themselves. Well, I said, I've got just the man for you, Harvey, but he is 92 years old. I don't care how old he is, Harvey said. I think he's the last brickmaker. You made my day, said Harvey J. Witherell. I gave him Mr. Black's address and phone number. When I called Mr. Black to warn him what was coming, he said he had already had a call from Washington. Where is Guyana? Mr. Black asked. It's a little country in South America, I said. And Mr. Black said, my, my. The very next day, on official government business and carrying his government briefcase, Harvey J. Witherell caught a plane from Washington to Winston-Salem. He and Mr. Black hit it off. They came to an agreement in one of the best deals in the history of American foreign aid. Mr. Black would go to Guyana for 10 days. He would take his granddaughter, Evelyn Abrams, who also knew how to make bricks, and a kid from the neighborhood, Thomas Brabham and they would go down there and teach these people how to make bricks. Mr. Black would be paid $100 per day. Not much, but I thought when I heard about it, but better than the dollar and a half he got from R.J. Reynolds. Harvey J. Witherell was awash with feelings of accomplishment. He said, this is a wonderful thing you're going to do, Mr. Black. We in Washington very much appreciate it. There was no false modesty in Mr. Black. He said, I believe you've picked the best man for the job to do the job for the USA. Planning commenced. No government planning is ever done simply, of course. Harvey J. Witherell had to formulate a detailed proposal for his own superiors and for higher-ups in Department of the State. He filled out reports in triplicate. He mapped and projected the hour. Hour by hour and village by village, he developed plans and exigency plans. He put in travel orders and meal requisite meal requisitions and meal requisitions <laughs> there are forms for these things and harvey j witherell followed the forms all this planning had to be coordinated with the u.s embassy in guyana of course and with the office of the guyanese prime minister forbes burnham and the whole thing had to have a name it was given the name operation blackjack it became a pretty big deal cables began flying back and forth between washington and georgetown the capital of guyana all of them bearing the capitalized admonition expedite Later, somebody sneaked copies of those cables out of the state for me to read. Uh, this did not constitute another Pentagon Papers case. They were not classified documents. I was astonished by their number and by the Baroque majesty of their prose. All his urgent intercontinental communication just to arrange for an elderly maker of bricks to show a few foreigners how it's done. A new appreciation of my government arose in my breast as I perused that tall stack of Operation Blackjack cables. Harvey J. Witherell was thrilled. His big project was proceeding apace. George Black was thrilled. He had barely been out of the county, and now he was about to be transported to a foreign land as an official representation, as an official representative of the United States government. I was pretty excited myself. As Latin American correspondent ten years ago, I had been to Guyana a number of times on assignment. I figured I still had credit in some of the bars in Georgetown, and this would be a chance to look up some old friends. As I awaited a final word of the departure date, however, calamity struck. Some high official of the Agency for International Development, some administrator whose job it was to review agency proposals and give them final approval, some insensible overseer, reading one of those forms Harvey J. Witherell had prepared in triplicate, describing Mr. Black in the perfect match of the man to the mission, said to himself, wait a minute, this man is 92 years old. He reached for a stamp, one that said canceled, or perhaps denied. 
stamped this stamp all over the proposal, and sent it tumbling back down through the bureaucracy, where it landed with a thud on the desk of Harvey J. Witherell. He called me again, this time almost in tears. It's all off, he said. They say he's too old. Well, Harvey, I said, way it goes. You sure tried hard. By now, I liked Harvey J. Witherell. He was one of those bureaucrats we're always hearing about. He had spent 20 years or more in government service. Now he was hovering on the brink of actually doing something. It didn't seem fair for Harvey's big idea to die this way, officially branded a bad idea. I felt the pain of his disappointment over the phone and did my best to cheer him up. Too bad, I said. Yep, too bad, he said. Well, so long. And he hung up. It was over. That is, it would have been over, except that right then we all got a lesson in how much, how one branch of government doesn't always know what the other branch is doing. Mr. Black, naturally, had been going around telling people about how he was going to Guyana. There was a good newspaper in Winston-Salem, The Sentinel. Somebody on the newspaper heard about Mr. Black's forthcoming trip and said, that's a pretty good story. The Sentinel ran the story on page one. Mr. Black is going to Guyana. The people at the United States Press Wire Service read the Winston-Salem Sentinel. Somebody there said, that's a pretty good story. The UPI picked up the story and transmitted it nationwide. Mr. Black is going to Guyana. The Washington Post subscribes to the United States Press Service. Some editor there said, that's a pretty good story. The Washington Post printed it with a wire photo of Mr. Black in his mud mill. Mr. Black is going to Guyana. The White House reads the Washington Post. Somebody at the White House said, that's a pretty good idea and showed it to somebody else who said, wouldn't it be wonderful if the president would see this man off? The timing could not have been more perfect. On precisely the same day that Mr. Black's trip to Guyana was being canceled by the State Department, the White House was inviting Mr. Black to stop off in Washington on his way to Guyana for the State Department to meet President Nixon in the Oval Office. Harvey J. Witherell, sitting there amid the wreckage of his dream, let his eye fall on the president's appointment schedule for the next week as published in the official register. 10 a.m. Wednesday, one item read, George Black, brickmaker of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who is going to Guyana to teach brickmaking at the invitation of USAID. This made Harvey J. Witherell feel much better. Whistling a little tune, he tore out a highlighted, he tore out this item, highlighted it with a yellow marker, and confidently sent it back up through the bureaucracy to the official who had stamped his idea canceled. Of course, all the wheels that hours before had rolled backward to a start, stop <laughs> now started running fast forward again. The project just stamped canceled was restamped high priority. Harvey called me to say I'd better make reservations after all. To Guyana. He said he didn't have time to talk. He said Mr. Black was coming to Washington to meet the president. Naturally, nobody at the White House thought to ask Mr. Black how he was going to get to Washington. He got there by taking the first airplane flight of his life. His granddaughter, Evelyn Abrams, sitting beside him on the plane, said it might have been his hundredth flight. That now he composed, that's how he composed he was. The White House told Mr. Black, bring your family with you. He did. He brought about 32 of them. Uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, and cousins from all up and down the eastern seaboard. The guard at the White House gate said, oh, no, this is way too many people. They discussed it. The guard said, I'll tell you what, I'll let half of you in. At a White House photo opportunity, they open the doors to the president's office for three minutes, and a herd of animals comes in, pushing and shoving. These are reporters and photographers competing for the most appealing photograph of the president and his visitor and straining for the quotable remark. I was one of the animals that day. This is a very nice family you have here, Mr. Black, said President Nixon. This is only half of them, Mr. Black exclaimed. The other half are waiting out there on the street. The man wouldn't let them in. The reporter scribbled notes. Why, that won't do, President Nixon said. And soon the other half of Mr. Black's family crowded into the Oval Office, filling it nearly to overflowing. So George Black got to meet the president, and so did his close and distant relatives. He did go to Guyana. I went along. There, Mr. Black taught brickmaking with such energy that he exhausted his official hosts, his village pupils, and a retinue of U.S. government hirelings, one of whom was probably the very official who had told Harvey J. Witherell that Mr. Black was too old for this trip. 
The problem was that in their attempts at brickmaking, the villagers kept getting it wrong, and Mr. Black wanted to stay until every villager got it right. One day, Mrs. Forbes Burnham, wife of the Prime Minister, fashionably dressed in a riding outfit, came out to one of the villagers in a limousine to be photographed for the local press with the visiting American brickmaker. Mr. Black nodded to her, extended a muddy hand, and went back to teaching brickmaking. He's quite a man, Mrs. Burnham said, as someone came up with the towel to wipe the mud from her hand. He was, too. I don't have many adventures, or many souvenirs for my adventures on the road, but the story of George Black I have, too. The first is one of his bricks, solid and strong like the man who made it. The second is a photograph of President Richard Nixon, standing awkwardly erect in the Oval Office, flanked by Mr. Black and his granddaughter at some of the other family members. The head of the International Agency for Development is in the picture, too. As for Harvey J. Witherell, the brave bureaucrat who had made this moment possible, he was in the room that day, only to find himself shoved rudely aside by a wire service photographer who said, Excuse me, buddy, let me get through here. He stepped in front of Harvey, and so did all the other photographers. Flash bulbs were popping. Immortality in the government archives was being bestowed. In the moment of his greatest achievement, Harvey had been pushed into the shadows. But bureaucrats are nothing, if not nimble. For in a corner of this photograph, one other white face appears at the extreme left, wearing the confident expression of a man who has just elbowed his way back into the picture. It is the face of Harvey J. Witherell. I absolutely love that story. Thanks for stopping by, Mona, who came in. Very nice. Love the intro. She's got to run. Very cool. All right. So let's, uh, if you're still here, if anybody's still here, say hi in the chat, please. I'll go back to the chat for a second. That was a long one. That's a long one. I know. I know it's a long one. Sorry about that. But it's uh, my favorite short story. I really like it. So I wanted to give it a shot. Let's see. I don't see anybody else in the chat. So let's keep spinning. Here we go. Let's spin the wheel. Ooh, a poem. Good, I love reading those. Let's go to the poetry. Book. going near the bottom. Let's do The Angel by William Blake. This is The Angel by William Blake. I dreamt a dream, what can it mean? That I was a maiden queen, guarded by an angel mild, witless woe was ne'er beguiled. And I wept both night and day, and he wiped my tears away. And I wept both day and night, and hid from him my heart's delight. So he took his wings and fled. Then the morn blushed rosy red. I dried my tears and armed my fears with ten thousand shields and spears. Soon my angel came again. I was armed. He came in vain. For the time of youth was fled, and gray hairs were on my head. Spend the week. Roses and thorns. Let us go to the chat, shall we? Roses and thorns is kind of a tradition in my family. You guys can do it too, where we go through our week or our day. It's our week here on the show, and we talk about what's great and what's not so great. Roses are the good things that happen, and thorns are the things that aren't quite as good. Uh, I'll start us off. Feel free to put your roses and thorns right there in the chat. We'll talk all about them. Uh, let's see, my roses this week. I got the show done today. Uh, I had breakfast with my wife this morning. That was very nice. I enjoyed that. Uh, I played a whole lot of Red Dead Redemption 2, which brought me a great deal of joy. Uh, oh, hey, I met Bob Odenkirk. How about that? I'll talk about that later on. But Bob Odenkirk's uh, one of my heroes, and he was in town for a book tour, so I got to meet him and get my picture taken with him, introduce him to my son, so that was pretty cool. 
uh my thorns was saturday uh we were supposed to take a big old family trip to go look at the leaves change at the uh blue ridge parkway and uh, debbie was really really tired she worked so hard my wife is named debbie uh, and uh, she works very hard as a nurse uh she's a night nurse and she slept until like 6 p.m and none of us had the heart to wake her up because she was so tired so we ended up not going so that was kind of a thorn but that's about it been in a really good mood Actually, I've been kind of depressed, not getting the things that I want to get, but not feeling bad about it. It's an interesting thing. The medications are at a right level now, so the depression is just has the volume turned down a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, a lot of the signs are still there, but some of them aren't. I'm not exhausted all the time. I, can st I, I take a lot of naps, but I can still get out of my chair and stuff, and I'm not uh, uncomfortable around people right now. So, yay. I don't think there's... Let's spin the wheel. Let's spin, who am I talking to? Let's spin the wheel. That makes sense. <laughs> okay. Whoever that, whoever you are out there, thanks for watching. So let's spin the wheel. All right, another poem. Let's do it. Again, another poem. If you're just joining the show, we're reading a poem. Here we go. This one is Time. <clears throat> Time is by Henry Van Dyke. Time is too slow for those who wait, too swift for those who fear, too long for those who grieve, too short for those who rejoice. But for those who love, time is not. Jump. Let's see if I can remember one. Back to the county club. <laughs> I got a list of jokes. I know of hundreds of them, but ah, heck, I'll just tell you one I know. Nobody's watching anyway. Uh, let's see. Man goes into the bartender. Man goes into the bar, and uh, he sits down. And he says to the bartender, "Listen, man, I want you to line up twelve shots of your best." scotch 12 of them right in a row do it now guy pours 12 shots very very expensive scotch guy picks it up boom 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 drinks all 12 shots right in front of the bartender bartender says what are you nuts man you're gonna kill yourself you can't drink like that guy says if you had what i had you'd drink like that too bartender says what do you have guy says a dollar got to hear david letterman tell that joke in person Makes me feel pretty cool. Let's spin the wheel. Ask me anything. I'll leave that open for anybody in the chat. If you're in the chat right now, now is your opportunity to ask me anything. Let's spin the wheel again. Yay. Oh, let's go to the poetry. This is a November night by Sarah Teasdale. There. See the line of lights, a chain of stars down either side of the street. Why can't you lift the chain and give it to me? Necklace for my throat. I'd twist it round and you could play with it. You smile at me as though I were a little dreamy child behind whose eyes the fairies live. And see, the people on the street look up at us, all envious. We are a king and queen. Our royal carriage is a motor bus. We watch our subjects with a haughty joy. How still you are. Have you been hard at work, and are you tired tonight? Is it so long since I have seen you? Four whole days, I think. My, my heart is crowded, 
full of foolish thoughts like early flowers in an April meadow, and I must give you them to you, all of them, before they fade. The people I have met, the play I saw, the trivial shifting things that loom too big or shrink too little, shadows that hurry, gesturing along a wall, haunted or gay, and yet they all grow real and take their proper size here, in my heart, when you have seen them. There's the plaza now, a lake of light. Tonight it almost seems that all the lights are gathered in your eyes, drawn somehow toward you. See the open park lying below us, with a million lamps, scattered in wise disorder like the stars. We look down on them as God must look down on constellations floating under him, tangled in clouds. Come then, and let us walk, since we have reached the park. It is our garden. All blossomless this winter night, but we bring April with us, you and I. We set the whole world on the trail of spring. I think that every path we ever took has marked our footprints in mysterious fire, delicate gold that only fairies can see. When they wake up at dawn in hollow tree trunks and come out on the drowsy park, they look along the empty paths and say, Oh, here they went, and here, and here, and here. Come, see, here is their bench. Take heads and let us dance around in a windy ring and make a circle round it only they can cross when they come back again. Look at the lake. Do you remember how we watched the swans that night in late October while they slept? Swans must have stately dreams, I think. But now the lake bears only thin, reflected lights that shake a little. How I long to take one from the cold black weather, new-made gold to give you in your hand. And see, and see, there is a star deep in the lake, a star! Oh, dimmer than a pearl. If you stooped down, your hand could almost reach it up to me. There was a new, frail, yellow moon tonight. I wish you could have had it for a cup with stars like dew to fill it to the brim. How cold it is. Even the lights are cold. They have put shawls of fog around them, see? What if the air should grow so dimly white that we would lose our way along the paths made new by walls of moving mist receding the more we follow? What a silver night. That our bench the time you said to me the long new poem, but how different now, how eerie with the curtain of the fog making it strange to all the friendly trees. There is no wind, and yet great curving scrolls carve themselves, ever-changing in the mist. Walk on a little. Let me stand here watching to see you, too, grown strange to me and far. I used to wonder how the park would be if one night we could have it all alone, no lovers with close arms and circled waists to whisper and break in upon our dreams. And now we have it every wish come true. We are alone now in a fleecy world. Even the stars have gone. We too, alone. Lovely. Let's spin to we. If there's anybody who's watching and you'd like to chat, just write something in the comments. I'll see it right away. And then I'll come in and we'll talk. Oh, just did three poems. Let's do uh, let's do Shakespeare. For you folks at home, you know we've been making our way through our sonnets. Uh, Shakespeare wrote. I shall put this down here. Shakespeare wrote over a hundred and forty sonnets. This is currently yeah. <laughs> we are currently on sonnet number one hundred and thirty-eight. <laughs> Sonnet 138 by William Shakespeare When my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, that she might think me some untutored youth unlearned in the world's false subtleties, thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past the best. Simply I credit her false speaking tongue. On both sides, thus, is simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not, she is unjust? And wherefore say not I, that I am old? Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust, and age in love loves not to have years told. Therefore I lie with her, and she with me, and in our faults, by lies, we flattered be. 
I like that one. That one's about being married, feels like. Yeah. All right. Cool. I'll spin the wheel. Wisdom. Excellent. I'm going to do a longer Alan Watts piece because I like it. Let's go to wisdom. Let's see. Got Eckhart Tolle, got Rumi, but I prefer Alan Watts. Let us start here. <clears throat> From the top. The essential point is obvious that each one of us, not only human beings, but every leaf, every weed, exists in the way it does only because everything else around it does. The individual and the universe are inseparable. But the curious thing is that while that is rather easy to see in theory, very few people are aware of it in the important, strong way that one is aware of blue and blue sky or the heat and fire. It's more of an idea than it is of a realization. The Earth is not a big rock infested with living organisms any more than your skeleton is bones infested with cells. The Earth is geological, yes, but this geological entity grows people, and our existence on the Earth is a symptom of the solar system, and it balances as much as the solar system, in turn, is a symptom of our galaxy, and our galaxy is, in its turn, a symptom of the whole company of galaxies. Goodness only knows what that's in. But you see, when as a scientist you describe the behavior of a living organism, you try to say what a person does. It's the only way in which you can describe what a person is, describe what they do. Then you find out in making this description, you cannot confine yourself to what happens inside the skin. In other words, you can't talk about a person walking unless you start describing the floor. Because when I walk, I don't just dangle my legs in empty space. I move in relationship to a room. So in order to describe what I'm doing when I'm walking, I have to describe the room. I have to describe the territory. So in describing my talking at, the at that moment, I can't just describe this thing as a thing in itself because I'm talking to you. So what I'm going to do is not necessarily described unless your being here is described also. So if that is necessary, if, in other words, in order to describe my behavior, I have to describe your behavior and the behavior of the environment, it means that we really got one system of behavior. What I am involves what you are. I don't know who I am unless I know who you are, and you don't know who you are unless you know who I am. There was a wise rabbi who once said, if I am I because you are you, and you are you because I am I, then I am not I, and you are not you. In other words, we are not separate. We define each other. We're all backs and fronts to each other. We and our environment, and all of us, each of us, are independent systems, interdependent systems. We know who we are in terms of other people. We all love together, and we are, I think, quite urgently, in need of coming to feel that we are the eternal universe, each one of us. That's some wisdom from Alan Watts. I like him. Yeah, I'm going to change this real quick. Let's see. Oop. There we go. We'll come back in a minute and see if it works. There. There you go. Why not? All right, let's spin the wheel. Oh, tricked you. Still no comments. Let's make sure we're still broadcasting. All right. All right, four, three, two, one. There's the high. There's the high. We're all here. Let's spin the wheel. Mock me, Wheel. Yeah, 
Hey, finally, let's sing a song. Do a campfire song. Let's see. Let's do a song about loneliness. What do you say? Huh? Let me move my main camera here. It should be bigger. Because that's what I'm feeling right now. It's a little bit of loneliness. So, let's find a song. Let's see. Leaving on a jet plane. All my bags are packed, I'm ready to go. I'm standing here outside your door. I hate to wake you up to say goodbye. But the dawn is breaking, it's early morn. The taxi's waiting, he's blowing his horn. Already I'm so lonesome, I could die. So kiss me and smile for me. Tell me that you'll wait for me. Hold me like you'll never let me go. Cause I'm leaving on a jet plane. I don't know when I'll be back again. Oh babe, I hate to go. There's so many times I've let you down, so many times I've played around. I tell you now, they don't mean a thing. Every place I go, I think of you. Every song I sing, I sing for you. When I'll come back, I'll wear your wedding ring. So kiss me and smile for me, tell me that you'll wait for me, hold me like you'll never let me go, cause I'm leaving on a jet plane, I don't know when I'll be back again, oh babe, I hate to go. Now the time has come to leave you one more time. Let me kiss you, then close your eyes. I'll be on my way. Dream about the days to come. I won't have to be alone. About the times when I won't have to say. Kiss me and smile for me. Tell me that you'll wait for me. Hold me like you'll never let me go. Cause I'm leaving on a jet plane. I don't know when I'll be back again. Oh babe, I hate to go. I love that song. A lot more now that I'm not traveling so much. It used to break my heart, man. That song used to make me cry. I don't mind telling you, because there's nobody watching. Let's spin the wheel. All right. I'm all right now, but last week I was in rough shape. I looked up my family tree. I found out I'm the sap. That's not it. All right, let's do, uh, let's do first couple minutes by Norm MacDonald there. <laughs> all right. I had a pork chop. I, I don't brag or anything like that, but it's in my belly right now as we speak. And I, uh, I realize that uh, you eat at a restaurant different than you eat at home, you know? Like at home, you would never put a pork chop on your skillet, you know, make it nice and hot on one side and then turn it over there and make it hot on the other side. And then you cut it into it in the middle, see how it's going there. And then you go, man, I'm going to enjoy eating this delicious pork chop. As soon as it's hot enough to eat, I'll eat it. But while I'm waiting, I'm going to have a big loaf of bread. Who would do that? With like 35 pats of butter. And I'll eat that loaf of bread and then I'll get my appetite sharpened up for the pork. I did this one last week. I'm going to switch it up. Suicide guy, because there's nobody watching. 
when I get to a dark place, I am quite fond of listening to George Carlin's second to last album where he got sober and saw the world clearly for the first time. Uh, it's his darkest comedy special, and it's called Life is Worth Losing. And this is The Suicide Guy. Now, just to change the subject a little bit, do you realize, do you realize that right this second, right now, somewhere around the world, some guy is getting ready to kill himself? Isn't that great? Isn't that great? You ever stop and think about that kind of shit? I do. It's fun, and it's interesting, and it's true. Right this second, some guy is getting ready to bite the big bazooka. Because statistics show that every year, a million people commit suicide. A million. That's 2,800 a day. That's one every 30 seconds. There goes another guy. And I say guy, I say guy because men are four times more likely than women to commit suicide, even though women attempted more. So men are better at it. That's something you else you gals will want to be working on. Well, if you want to be truly equal, you're going to have to start taking your lives in greater numbers. But I just think it's interesting to know. Interesting. That's a big word in this show for me. It's interesting to know that at any moment, the odds are that some guy is dragging a chair across the garage floor, trying to get it right underneath that ceiling beam, wouldn't want it to be too far off center. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Somewhere else is another guy going over and getting a gun out of a dresser drawer. Somebody else is opening up a brand new package of razor blades. Maybe struggling with the cellophane a little bit, you know? God damn it, it's always something. Fucking shit. I just think that's an interesting as hell. That's probably the most interesting thing you can do with your life. End it. I don't think I could do that, though, could you? God, I couldn't commit suicide if my life depended on it. But I understand it, you know, I think I do. I don't wonder about it. I don't wonder, well, why did he do it? What was he going through his mind? You know what I wonder? Where do you find the fucking time? Who's got time to be committing suicide? Aren't you busy? I got shit to do. Suicide will be way down on my list. Probably down past lighting my own house on fire. I might want to try a little self-mutilation first, you know? Take a couple of hunks out of my arm, see if I like the general idea. Because you gotta have priorities, man, you know? And... You got to have a plan, too, for something like that. You got to plan that shit. You people don't just run out of the house and jump off a bridge. There are things you have to decide. Timing is important. When you're going to do it. Well, let me see now. Wednesday's out. Got to take Timmy to the circus. Survivor's on on Thursday. Friday, I got my colon cleansing. The folks are coming over on Sunday. Sunday. By God, that'd be just the thing. Maybe mom will find my body. Serve her right for fucking me up the way she did. Then you have to pick a method. How you're going to do it. Well, let me see now. Afraid of heights, that's no good. Can't swallow pills, don't like the sight of blood. Fucking oven's electric. I'd lie down in front of a train, except the Amtrak hasn't come through here in 500 fucking years. Maybe I'll just take a gun and shoot myself in the mouth. Suppose I miss. People be laughing at me. Suppose I live. I'll have a big fucking hole in my head. I'll have to wear some kind of dumbass hat. Well, I guess I'll just hang myself. That'd be good. Gotta get a rope. Ah, shit, it's always something. Got a rope in the garage. It's got a lot of grease and paint on it. Don't want to get that stuff on my neck. Walmart's having a special on rope this weekend. No sense spending a lot of money to kill myself. Then again, I can always put it on my credit card. I never have to pay the fucking thing. That's it, Dan. I'm hanging myself and Walmart's paying for it. What's next? The note. Oh, Jesus. I got to express myself. Hell, if I could express myself, I wouldn't be thinking about doing something like this. Where's a pen? I can never find a pen. I told those kids not to move the pen away from the telephone. Goddamn kids. I ought to just kill them too. Make it one of them family package deals. Here's a pen. I ought to just damn it into my fucking neck and get it over with. Let's see now. Where do you put the date? Upper left? I can never remember that. To whom it may concern. Sounds kind of impersonal. Dear Marzell. Leaves out the kids. I know. Hey, guys, guess what? Keep on reading. How are you? I hope you are fine. I am not fine. As you can no doubt tell from me hanging here from the Sailor Fixture. You are the ones who drove me to do this. I was doing just fine until you fuckers came along. I hope you're happy now that I'm goddamn dead. Sign the corpse in this room. P.S. Fuck you people. 
Yeah, good enough. That'd be a good note. I don't think a good, I don't think a writer could ever commit suicide. Do you? A writer would be too busy working on the goddamn note all year. First draft, second draft, third revision, whole new ending. Finally, turn into a book proposal and have a reason to live. I think about stuff like that. It's interesting to me. Like I said, certain things are interesting. Suicide's interesting. Life is filled with interesting things. That's why I could never commit suicide. I'm having too much fun keeping an eye on you folks, watching what you do. Human behavior. That's what I like. There we go. Dude, we are somebody. Tony's here. Yay. Oh, need the karaoke accompaniment. That's valid. Hey, good to see you, buddy. Let me go back to the chat. I'm a zooming in. All right. Now, Tony's here, and he gave us a couple of useful things. First of all, he said that you need the karaoke accompaniment, and that's valid, right? It would sound better with the karaoke accompaniment, but sadly, I cannot get the karaoke accompaniment to link. It, uh, the karaoke accompaniment has a lag of about two seconds that I cannot overcome while I'm singing live. Plus, if I use the karaoke accompaniment, I get uh, copyright strikes. If I sing a cappella, I don't. It's mostly for me. I hope it's uh, endurable but valid. And Tony also said, dude, we are somebody. You are indeed somebody. Good to see you, Mr. Knuckles. Thanks for coming to the big show. Why is this screen look different every week? I never change the settings. So small. Doesn't matter. Anyway, you are somebody and I'm glad you're here, Tony. Thanks for coming in. And thank you always for giving excellent notes. Let us spin the wheel. Boy, roses and thorns. All right, I'll tell you all about it. Let's go to the chat, shall we? Hey, Tony, you know how this works. Roses and thorns. Roses are the good things that happen to you. Thorns are the rough things. This week, I did this once already, but there was nobody in the room, so I'll tell you about it. I got to meet Bob Odenkirk. How do you like them apples, Tony? Bob Odenkirk, the Bob. I got to tear the loo out of him and everything, which is a reference to his show, Mr. Show, from the 90s, which I absolutely love. Uh, my son and I got to go see him and uh, had a couple of our books signed. Uh, he did a book signing with his daughter in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that was a delight. We only had about a minute of interaction, about an hour of wait, and it was easily worth it. That was my rose. The thorn was on Saturday we didn't do anything. We were supposed to go on a trip and look at the leaves changing. But uh, we ended up not doing it because my wife was sleeping so hard because uh, she worked so hard and she needed some rest. So we ended up not going. So that's my rose and thorns. What were your roses and thorns this week, Tony? I'll be right back. Find the picture of your dog very comforting. Wisdom! Let's head on down to the wisdom room. Let's see. We were just making our way through some Alan Watts. He's my favorite philosopher because I'm not very smart and he's easy to digest. So let us go to the wisdom of Alan Watts. <clears throat> now, you should be different. So, the human being, though, it finds it's difficult to understand because we're always telling each other, now, you should be different. You ought to change. Don't be like that. Now, listen, you're sick and I've got a system. See? I've got a system. I've got a real school here, a thing that's very important, and you should come and study with me. It may not be mine, but it may be some big sage or pundit that I know, and you should come around and study that. And I thought about this for a long time because I've heard every kind of opinion of all the sorts of things that I should do in order to get myself into shape. And I realized that if I followed this advice, I would spend my entire day doing exercises in preparation for life. I don't know when I would ever get around to that, you know? I would have half an hour's yoga practice, one hour of Zazen, so much physical exercise, and so much memory practice, so much special diet preparation to be sure that I got proper food. And if I thought this all through, I think, oh my God, it wasn't worth it. Then another school of thought will say, no, 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 that's the thing. You're getting confused. Just do one thing, see? But then I say, now, how am I going to choose which one I'm going to do? Well, he says, obviously, this one's the best. And then before you know it, where you are, you're sewed up by some religious fanatic. Now, please, 
I don't want to do this to you. Please don't think that I have such recipes, that I'm going to give you anything to do for five minutes every morning. I just am not. I want to. My whole notion would be to set you all free so that you'd only have to attend one seminar and never come back. That's the idea, really, because I know that, so far as my own livelihood is concerned, that there are always more people. And if I don't collect a following and just send them all away, there are plenty more to fill the vacuum. But this is the important thing. This is the old idea that we're going to work on, that you are like a dewdrop on a multidimensional spider's web early in the morning. And if you look at that thing carefully, you will see that in every dewdrop there are reflections of all the other dewdrops. So the way that dewdrops looks goes on with all the other ones in it. See? A particular glimmer in it and so on. It's peculiar position. And everybody has to have a peculiar position in the cosmos. So you see the reflections of every one of them are different according to the position they're in and the other dewdrops that they reflect in such and such angles. But nevertheless, the whole network all the dewdrops depend on each individual dewdrop, and each individual dewdrop mutually depends on all the others. And that's the sort of scheme we're living in. And, and it's a little bit affronts our logic at first, because we say, I can understand that I depend on this universe, because after all, I need sunlight and air and water and the help of a society and that kind of thing. I needed a father and a mother. But looking at it from the other point of view, I find it very difficult to see how the whole thing depends on me. That's because we've been brought up with a put-down theory of the individual. You know, children should be seen and not heard. You are the servant and subject of God, and don't you ask impertinent questions. Or another way of putting us down is to say, well, you're just a little piece of a fluke and, and a mindless mechanism. See? We always manage not to find out the relationship of the network is mutual. It runs both ways. That it depends on you just as much as you depend on it. Because, you see, it's you with your ingenious brain that, for example, turns vibrations of air into sound. You turn whatever the sun is doing into light. You turn whatever the air is doing into the sky into something called blue. There is only blue for a brain. Just like if you hit a drum and it's got no skin, it won't make any noise. So it's the tight skin that evokes the noise out of the moving fist. No skin, no noise. So you, as the reflector, like the dewdrop reflects, you, as the so-called reflector of all that goes on by the constitution of what kind of reflector you are, you evoke what we call sun, moon, and stars, nebula, vast spaces. It's only vast in relation to you. They're not really vast. Only if you compare them with yourself, they're vast. They could be considered very tiny, or equally, the space between two sides of a hair could be considered vast if you want to think about it that way. I mean, if you really want to go into a hair there is an awful lot between one diameter of hair you know and if you think about it a long time and you think it's what we call a vast subject the study of hair like microscopy it is a vast subject depends on the attitude you see it's from alan watts nice dad is here yay all right let's go to the chat Dude, we are somebody. All right. Now, Tony, he said, only because you said a couple of times that since there's nobody here, and at the time you had three viewers. It's a weird thing. I think that the lag, uh, never mind. I, I have a little screen that shows me how many viewers I have. It's not on the main screen. I had to click on it, so it's not constant. It's only once in a while. So when I clicked on, maybe I, it said zero, but uh, I should be pretending anyway, right? I'm glad you're here. Thanks, Tony. I'm glad Dad's here. Roses and thorns. Here's Tony's roses and thorns. Tony dropped a new short. Rose. Nice. Everybody go check that out. Tony Knuckles. Dad. Uh, we didn't tape a new episode. Thorn. Uh, it's tricky. It's always tricky with more than one person. And, of course, my dad is here, ladies and gentlemen. The show may now start. We'll probably break out some Carlin in the coming minutes. Uh, let's sit here for a sec. Yeah, Alan Watts. Hey, PJ. I need some, need some of that on. <laughs> oh, man, I forgot what it's called. That the uh, echoey sound. I need some of that on the Alan Watts. Yeah, I try. The whole point of this thing, the happy place, is I'm just trying to get stuff inside my head that I like. I don't have an excuse to read it, like poetry and Shakespeare. I don't interact with that stuff at all, all week, except on this show. So that's one of the reasons I do it. Are you an Alan Watts fan? You have a favorite quote, anything like that? Point me in the right direction. Maybe you have a third favorite philosopher. I'm trying to figure it all out. Hello to BJ, by the way. Uh, BJ is a dear friend of mine uh, from the Carnival Dream. 
there she is right there and uh we hung out and had tea lots of times we went on an adventure in alaska together she's a wonderful lady and a brilliant musician and a friend of mine and i miss her uh where are you where are you nowadays bj are you working or are you home i, mean, I know you live in oklahoma but you're probably someplace uh, exotic and fun sounding yay thorn still in massive debt how'd you do that oh wait hold on there's two of them at once Okay, first of all, Rose, she's going on a Trans-Pacific next year. Fantastic. Congratulations. I'm so excited that you get to see Europe. I think that's what's on the other side of the Pacific. I might be thinking the Atlantic. Trans-Pacific, that's Japan. There's no qualifications for me to have this show. I don't know anything. Okay, just putting it on there. But still, that's very exciting. Which ship are you going on? What position are you playing? And the Thorn is still in massive debt. I can't believe you're still in debt. I'm so sorry. Well, working on cruise ships, uh, say what you will. Great way to get out of debt. Miss you. Hope you're doing all right. If anybody else has any comments, uh, pop them up on the big board. That's so weird. Why does it look like that? I don't understand that. All right. Let's spin the wheel. Trans-Pacific. Yeah, I think that's, that's Japan. Asia and Japan, the other side of the Pacific. It's all coming back to it. Oh, everybody's complaining about the song. Oh, yay! Wait, hold on. I'm not going to sing that song. I'm too self-conscious now. But she's working on the Splendor out of Sydney, Australia. That's the detail that we were looking for. Tell me more about that. Oh, that's cool. All right, let's spin the wheel again. Not a song, not a song, not a song. Everybody thinks I need background music. I got nothing. I haven't done a Zen Cohen yet. Hey, nice. All right, let's go to the campfire. We are almost done, my friend. Zen Cohen's, there are only about 100 of them uh, that I'm aware of, and I have made it through at like 98. So let's see where we left off. <clears throat> yeah, wow, wow. This is Zen Cohen number 100, The Silent Temple. Shoiki was a one-eyed teacher of Zen, sparkling with enlightenment. He taught his disciples to Fuku Temple. Day and night, the whole temple stood in silence. There was no sound at all. Even the reciting of sutras was abolished by the teacher. His pupils had nothing to do but meditate. When the master passed away, an old neighbor heard the ringing of bells and the recitation of sutras. They knew Shoichi had gone. Oh, more information. Thank you so much for typing this stuff up. Makes it way more fun. Now, that she's going to be on Japan via the Luminosa. That's the new one. As a soloist, no longer management. Yay! Oh, man. I'm so glad to hear that. I wouldn't want to be in charge of anything out there. With no, with, with no power comes no responsibility. It's like Spider-Man, but opposite. That's very, very cool. And be, Oh, she wants to hear Modern Major General with my words. Oh, man. I don't even remember them all. And I don't have them written down anywhere. I'll try. What the hell? Maybe they'll come. Hold on. I am the very model of a modern day comedian. I'm funniest to those of you with IQs high or median. I always tell the truth so all my stories are relatable. I try to look my best, but that's a subject that's debatable. I've studied all the work of Carlin Cosby and Jim Gaffigan. The wit of Brian Wiegand makes me laugh and makes me laugh again. With history of comedy, I'm teeming with a lot of news. With many poignant facts about the false arrest of Lenny Bruce. Many false, false arrest of Lenny Bruce. Many false, false arrest of Lenny Bruce. Many false, false arrest of Lenny, Lenny Bruce. I understand the difference between sarcasm and irony. And after every show, I secretly hope they don't fire me. In short, for those of you possessing IQs, I am median. I am the very model of a modern day comedian. That's all I can remember, and that's good enough. All right, let's spin the video. I haven't done a show in years. That's not true. I did a show last week. Did three shows last week. Didn't do that song. Should have. It's fun. Thanks, BJ. Appreciate you being a friend and a fan. All right, a poem. Let's go. Poetry poem. This. This.
this is Love and Friendship by Emily Bronte. Love is like the wild rose briar, friendship like the holly tree. The holly is dark when the rose briar blooms, but which will bloom most constantly? The wild rose briar is sweet in spring, its summer blossoms scent the air, yet wait till winter comes again, and who will call the wild briar fair? Then scorn the silly rose wreaths now, and deck thee with the holly sheen, that when December blights thy brow, he still may leave thy garland green. Hey! Hey, Tony, hold up. I redid the framing. I don't know if you noticed, Tony. I appreciate you saying so. Hold on. Gave me great feedback. Uh, I've decided to go instead of half and half with a rule of thirds framing so that the words will show up there. Uh, I haven't posted on TikTok in two weeks. I was waiting for somebody to notice. Uh, nobody has. Uh, but I'm going to start doing it again anyway just because it's a good habit to get in. And now that I know that you're following, right? Okay, I ought to. So you'll see some other bearded versions of me and you'll see me in a suit and a beard because <laughs> I'm like five episodes behind. But uh, thanks for noticing. I appreciate it. All right, let's spin the wheel. Follow me on TikTok, friends. I'm at uh, Johnny Melwater for your convenience. There we go. Yay, Shakespeare. All right, let's go to the Shakespeare stage. Two thirds, and then I'll put the words up here. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully, this thing over here will still move back and forth in the frame to look okay. But look at the size of my giant head. Isn't that too much? Do you really want that on your TikTok? All that giant head? It doesn't matter. It's fine. Let's do some Shakespeare. Stop looking at myself. All right, we did today's sonnet. Let us do something from Roman's Countryman. Yeah. I but to die, go home. Alas, poor Yorick. Though yet. Oh, let's do the one. Let's do Aaron's. I, I really like Aaron's uh, speech from Titus Andronicus right before he gets hung. It's evil and it's short. So let's see if I can find it. My eyesight's getting progressively worse, as happens to almost everybody. It's a lot of dead time, and I'm sorry about that. Well, I can't find it. Let us do something else, too. Let's do all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They each have their entrances and exits. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape and line, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in the sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. That's good stuff. Oh, my mistake. Let's go to the chat. Now, 
Now, TikTok isn't a medium I can do from the ship very well. Replaced on Instagram. I, I, I put it up on the Instagram stories for two months because uh, I didn't want my whole feed to be these things. Uh, oh, hi. Good to see you. Um, I, let's see. This is here. Uh, I lost, <laughs> lost my track. Here you go. It's not a medium she can do from the ship very well. Repost on Instagram. I will. I'll put a couple of them up there for you. Thank you. Uh, it's just, it's tricky. I'm trying to figure it out. But watch your stories. That's where I usually do it. Tony said, we got, we got six viewers. New record. Very, very nice. Welcome to each and every one of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Done. Eugenie, I'm so glad you're here. I always mispronounce your name. Lady E, welcome back. I hope you're well. Right now, we got Tony Knuckles. He's a comedian and a magician, I believe. Definitely a comedian. And we have uh, BJ Novak, who is a brilliant musician and my friend. And, of course, my dad is here. So if you have any questions for musicians, entertainers, or uh, old, 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 old men. Just kidding, Dad. I love you. Uh, type them in the chat. We can have a discussion. I'm trying to spend more time in the chat, you know. This is, this is the good stuff. This is the stuff that people enjoy and that I enjoy doing. We got seven. Yay. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. Seven, seven, seven. Hooray. I don't know. If we get to ten, I win. Uh, I don't know. There's probably some confetti or something I can throw. We'll figure it out. But all right, we got seven viewers. Let's hold on to them and let's do something interesting. Remember, if you want to chat, type it in the chat. I'll be right back. Let's spin the wheel. We'll do a monologue after this. Come on, monologue. Come on, monologue. Good enough. I love a good poem. Let's go to the poetry corner. The, the bottom chin gets its own third. Okay, here we go. We were doing some lovely poems. This, <clears throat> this is Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Nice. Take that, seven people. They love it. Did a poem, so let's do a monologue. Nine. Oh my God, the words out, man. This is very, very exciting. All right, for the all nine, type in the chat. Say hello if you're here and you want to say hi. Type in the chat. I'll talk with you. But first, uh, let's go to the theater for my monologue. I've been breaking this one. I would like to do uh, something by Rowan Atkinson, one of my favorite comedy writers. Uh, you probably know him as Mr. Bean. This is Welcome to Hell. Let's see if I can find it. Fatal Beatings. Jailhouse Story. Wedding from Hell. And now from Nazareth. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, a red light. And I'm standing in front of flames of hell. Ah, oh, hello! Oh, nice to see you all again. Well, as the more perceptive of you have probably realized by now, this is hell, and I am the devil. Good evening. Uh, you may call me Toby, if you like. We try to keep things informal here, as well as infernal. <laughs> That's just a little joke I tell it every time. Now, you're here for all eternity which i hardly need to tell you is a heck of a long time so you all get to know each other pretty well by the end but for now i'm going to have to split you into groups and would you stop screaming thank you now murderers murderers over here please thank you looters and pillagers over here um thieves if you could join them and uh, lawyers you're in that lot as well fornicators if you could step forwards my God, there are a lot of you. 
I think I'll split you into adulterers and the rest. Male adulterers, if you could just form a line in front of that small guillotine in the corner. Hmm, yes. The French. Oh, uh, the French here. Yes, if you'll just come down here with the Germans, I'm sure you'll have plenty of talk about. Um, atheists? Atheists? Over here, please. You must be feeling a right bunch of nitwits right now. <laughs> and finally, Christians. Christians? Yes, well, I'm afraid it turns out the Jews were right. Okay, right, well, are there any questions? Yes. No, no, I'm afraid we don't have any toilets. If you'd read your Bible, you might have seen that it was damnation without relief. So if you didn't go before you came, I mean, I'm afraid you're not going to enjoy yourself very much, but I believe that is the idea. Well, it's over to you, Adolf, and I'll catch you all at the barbecue later. Bye. Beautiful. Come on, how about that guy? Nine, wow. This is very exciting. We're going to go back to the chat, shall we? Scratch your nose. Look at this. We got up to seven. Huh? Then we got up to eight. Very exciting. The word got out. You never can tell when the algorithm is going to decide to show me the people. But if they don't check in, don't really count. Let's see what my number says. My current number says... Seven, six. I guess one of them was me. Seven, six. Very, very nice. There you go. I try not to dwell too much on the numbers or else <laughs> the realization would crush me. Uh, still, it's good. Thanks for being here. You're my favorite eight out of everybody. Seriously, you're awesome. Let's spin the wheel. Or Shakespeare, why not? See if I can find that thing I wanted to do. Nope, 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 nope. Once more into the breach, nope. Sonnets, nope. Aspiring blood, nope. Hot spur, kind of name is hot spur. Ah, uh, all right. Bummer. Do Richard the <clears> Third. <throat> now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that loud upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, Instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking lass, I, that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time to this breathing world, scarce half made up, and not so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why, I, in this weak, piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, and lest to spy my shadow in the sun, and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain, and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Richard III. I didn't even see the first two. There was a Richard II. A whole different play. No Richard I, though. I'm kind of curious about him. No? 
just did Shakespeare. No way I like it. Let's keep it moving. Zen Cohen's feelings. All right. All right, our very last Zen Cohen. Here we go. This is exciting for me. We've made it. That means there's got to be at least 100 episodes. I would have kept track if I cared. Ladies and gentlemen, the final Zen Cohen. This is Zen Cohen number 101, unless I'm very much mistaken, which is absolutely possible. This is Zen Cohen 101, Buddha's Zen. Buddha said, I consider the positions of kings and rulers as that of dust motes. I observe treasures of gold and gems as so many bricks and pebbles. I look upon the finest silken robes as tattered rags. I see myriad worlds of the universe as small seeds of fruit and the greatest lake in India as a drop of oil on my foot. I perceive the teachings of the world to be the illusion of magicians. I discern the highest conception of emancipation as a golden brocade in a dream and view the holy path of the illuminated ones as flowers appearing in one's eyes. I see meditation as a pillar of a mountain, nirvana as a nightmare of daytime. I look upon the judgment of right and wrong as the serpentine dance of the dragon and the rise and fall of beliefs as but traces left by the four seasons. And thus end the 101 Zen Cone. Da 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 Right? We did it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Questions in the chat. Thanks for getting involved in the chat. All right. Modern Major General, Luminosa, TikTok. Six viewers, good afternoon. Seven, nine, ten. How exciting. Now, BJ said, I totally need to see some more Shakespeare. Which films do you reckon I should watch? I'll tell you what got me going. I was working ships. I wasn't into Shakespeare when I started on ships. Uh, but I downloaded and watched uh, the David Tennant version of Hamlet, which is extraordinary. It has Patrick Stewart playing two excellent roles. Uh, and that got me into it. His performance in that was so naturalistic and fluid and... It felt real. It's very, I, I can't do reality with Shakespearean words, but he can do reality with Shakespearean words, and it's incredible. I highly recommend it. I'm also a big fan of the Scottish play. There's several versions of that. They're all really good. My favorite version is the Patrick Stewart version. Uh, the settings are in, like, uh, revolutionary Russia or something like that. I don't know why they make it anywhere but Scotland. I don't know why they always got to do that, but uh, it's really good. Fantastic performance later in his life. Um, and the Michael Fassbender version is very interesting, but it's tough to watch and listen to because for some reason the director decided that all the lines, I'm going to start the Zen Cohen's over, that all the lines should have been spoken very softly since they can't be done that way. Uh, and there's also a version, a new version by the Cohen brother, well, one of the Cohen brothers, I believe it's Ethan or Joel. It's one of the two. You look it up. I'm busy. Uh, I believe Ethan Cohen did it with, um, Denzel Washington. It's on Apple plus and it's excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, so that's good. Let's see what else is fun. I like Richard III with uh, Ian McKellen. Anything with Ian McKellen is interesting. I just watched King Lear with Ian McKellen. Uh, there's a really good play that's about a Shakespearean production. It's about uh, an old man who's the head of a theater company during World War II who's becoming senile and is sort of led along by his dresser. That's called The Dresser. There's two versions of it. The second version of it's the only thing that Ian McKellen and Anthony Hopkins did together. And I highly recommend that. I believe that's on Stars or can be downloaded illegally if you work on ships. Again, it's called The Dresser. After the Zen Cohen's, I was just going to start the Zen Cohen's over. I'm trying to think of other things I can read. I really need things I can read. I like reading. I, I, I think Mark, he, he, he submitted some original work, but he hasn't come in yet. So I want to read some of his stuff. Uh, I want to read people's poems. I want to read things that are interesting to hear, inspiring, things that are fun to read. So keep thinking. I, I've got Zen Cohen on the wheel. I'm just going to start over with number one. You haven't heard him yet. That's the plan. All right, then. Let's keep it going, folks. Only one or two wheels. Oh, one wheel spin left. Here we go. Like 
like singing. We're gonna skip that. Oh, oh, you want some Edgar Allan Poe? Yeah, sure. Hold on. We go to the poetry corner. I don't have any of the short stories yet, so all I have is his poems. Let us read some Edgar Allan Poe. We have a lot of Poe, but my favorite is obviously we have the Raven, but that's we'll save that for next week. Annabelle Lee. This is Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. It was many a year ago in the kingdom by the sea. I was a child and she was a child. Whoop, wrong button. <clears throat> Stop, whoop, whoop. cut that out. Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea, but we loved with a love that was more love than love, I and my Annabelle Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, so that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels not half so happy in heaven when envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. But the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride in her sepulcher, there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. There you go. There we go. Let's spin the wheel. No, actually, we're all done. Let's go to the chat. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you had some fun. Have an even better show next week. Thank you for the idea of how to make some food. Thanks for tuning in. It makes me feel so welcome. I appreciate all you guys. Uh, and until next time, we'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Keep shining through, just like you always do. And the blue skies will push the dark clouds far away. And would you please say hello to the folks that I know and tell them I won't be long. They'll be happy to know that as you saw me go, I was singing this song. We'll meet again. Don't know where, I don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Thanks for watching. Till next time, be good but not too good.